welcome to the Nerd Party. Hello and welcome to another episode of Missing Frames. This is the podcast where we watch all the movies we should have seen by this point in our lives. I'm your host, Sean Eastridge. We're hanging out on the Nerd Party Network, a collection of podcasts dedicated to all things entertainment. Make sure to check us out at thenerdparty.com and make sure you're following us on Twitter at Join Nerd Party and on Facebook and Instagram just at The Nerd Party. We have hit another milestone episode this is episode 120 and if you are familiar with these episodes it's every 10 episodes we get a new landmark you know we got to bring back one mr brad gullickson into the picture welcome back brad hello happy to be here we're always happy to have you and because this is just so much i don't know excitement energy joy there's so many emotions it can barely be contained to just two hosts we needed to bring on somebody else so we are actually we've got the actual couple of the comic book couples counseling podcast here with us today that's right lisa gullickson joining us for her very first official missing frame episode welcome lisa i figured brad would just warm up the crowd for 11 or so episodes and then (laughs) when they're really ready then here I come onto Here the you podcast, are. Lisa. Gullickson. The audience, they're ready. They need this. This is what they've been craving, and this is the content we bring you, people. I hope you're happy. But yeah. this is this is such a delight for me. I love you both so much, and we got to sit together uh, in Sundance 2020 and kind of do a between takes episode. But this is the first, and we've done. I do. I was on uh, one of your episodes talking about Superman. Yeah. That's right. Uh, which that was a lot of fun. But this is the first time you've been here, and I'm so delighted. These, our two lines are not parallel. They have intersected and it feels great. It feels really great. And I think what I want to remind people of, if you're not familiar, Brad and I accidentally, well, kind of intentionally, it started on (laughs) episode 30 of Missing Frames. Brad, that was his first episode, I believe, was Dirty Harry? Yes. Yes. So you introduced me to Dirty Harry and then it kind of just, we kept the tradition going every 10 episodes so like episode 40 50 60 70 every milestone episode including episode 100 brad and i would trade off introducing each other to movies that we absolutely love we've had so many great ones we did big trouble in little china the graduate uh cinema paradiso which was i think kind of a movie that you loved and hadn't seen in a while i don't know if it technically counted but last one we did I can't believe, like, it was Wings of Desire, Vim Vendor's Wings of Desire, which is one of my favorites. And that feels like it was years ago. I can't Such believe it's been so long. a great movie. And it has led to one of the most magnificent podcast memories. And I, you know, forgive me, but I cannot remember your listener who was in oh Berlin at the time and took a yes. photo of himself listening to our episode in Berlin and whoa. Yeah, that was um Julian. He's such an awesome guy. So Julian is a regular listener of the show and he reached out with that photo. Basically, he showed us a shot in Berlin of one of the locations in Wings of Desire. Uh, and he had his, his phone up listening to the Missing Frames episode, which is so cool. And Julian's just like, He's awesome. He, uh, you know, he reached out to me and was like, hey, I want to like send you a couple movies that I know you've never seen before. And he sent me a couple Criterion films and it was such a kind, sweet gift. And he's always been so supportive and he's awesome. This is just this is now the Julian Love Fest. So uh, Julian, as I, it should if you're be. listening, I, mean, I hope honestly, you're happy. It, it was an incredible moment. I saved his photo. I look at it on a regular basis. No <laughs> BS. So great. I'm like, I've had an impact. (laughs) (laughs) Now I'm only going to be satisfied if we get a picture of Julian in the eighth dimension. (laughs) (laughs) Julian, get on it. Get on it. No, it's, it's, he's wonderful. So that was, that was the last episode though. And it's been, I mean, that was 
I want to say July. So it has been almost a year since we've done one of these, which I was like, was that pre pandemic? I don't even <laughs> no, know. I, I don't even know. Time doesn't make sense. I think we're in the eighth dimension. I don't even know what time is anymore, but we're referencing the movie. We haven't even said what the movie is. We're going to be watching. I'm going to say the full title. I, yes. I had a moment where I was like, should I just abbreviate it and say Buckaroo no. Banzai? No, it is the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension which is a film I have never seen. It's one of Brad's favorites, I'm presuming. And yes. Lisa loves it so much that when she heard we were doing it, she was like, I'm getting in on this. I have some opinions and I want to share them. <laughs> okay, so just to be clear, but like this is, I mean, I, I know literally nothing about the movie outside of the title. I know Peter Weller is in it and I didn't yes. want to look too much into it as I often don't when I'm watching a film for Missing Frames that I haven't. Like, I don't have any real knowledge of. And it was directed by W.D. Richter, who I was looking at him just to get a feel for what has he done? And it's like, oh, so he's got a pretty extensive writing background as far as like he wrote the 1978 invasion of the body snatchers yeah. which i absolutely love he wrote big trouble in little yes. china which is a fantastic film but this was his directorial debut and i get the feeling and i you know i glimpsed a little bit at the the history but i get the feeling this is probably not super well received or a super big hit when it came out in 1984 well, I mean, it came out against Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, Ghostbusters, and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. All right. <laughs> so uh, not fair. Not fair. Like, I do wish we lived in that fringe universe where the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension was the top spot that weekend and not <laughs> Ghostbusters, Temple of Doom or Star Trek three. But this is the world we were given. And, you know, this is one of those films that I never saw in the theater, but as a young child, I caught on VHS and I liked it a lot when I was a kid. I was like, this is a really cool, strange movie, but I didn't like revisit it the way that I would revisit the Indiana Jones movies or star Wars or the star Trek films mm. or ghostbusters or, or, you know, so because I like, uh, you're like, you're like, I wish this movie had been as, as popular as those, but, but also blame. I love all those movies way more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm to blame. I, well, I loved all those movies more at the time. And what oh. happened was I got a hold of a VHS bootleg of Buckaroo Banzai at a con somewhere in my teen years, in the high school years, maybe even early college. And I watched it again and I was like blown away by my rewatch because it is such a strange film. It does feel like a directorial debut, but it also has like this intense mythology around it and it doesn't explain everything you have so many questions about this world and it ignites an intense curiosity and like when i watch it today and i rewatch it I, i've rewatched it many times like you 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 desire for the comic book spinoffs you desire for mm. the television show spinoffs you desire for the sequels that never happened it feels like a shared universe that was aborted <laughs> <laughs> so they're really so this is not necessarily a film that has like had a resurgence in in the past like you know in the 20 we've seen so many different franchises fall by the wayside and kind of like you know old 80s films or things that have a beloved cult following like that really really lift it up and kind of give it its reputation and another second life but like this you're saying this movie hasn't really had that even in comic books or things like that. Well, there was a comic book series not too long ago that tried to like re kickstart the love of this franchise because it does have a cult following and it has gotten onto Blu-ray and you will find hardcore nerds. It feels like it would be. And I, I literally thought like, Oh, this would be like a shout Blu-ray and it is, but yep. it's also no longer. It looks like it's out of print. It is $130. Yeah 
on Amazon for anybody interested. You can't have mine. You know, Julian, not tempting you, but you know, if you want to <laughs> send Brad a copy of Buckaroo Banzai, I'm sure he will love you forever. And you know, places like the Alamo and the AFI Silver around us will play it on the big screen and crowds will show up to it. Lisa and I have seen it on the big screen now a couple of times and it is <laughs> wow. glorious. Is it glorious, Lisa? It is glorious. What I okay. like right now, preparing for this podcast, I was like, okay, uh, deep research. I'm just going to pull up the IMDb page <laughs> and the Wikipedia. And like, one thing I want you to understand, Sean, is that the number one thing that the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension is, is a vibe. Like, I read, okay. like, for one thing, Buckaroo Banzai, the sexiest character ever created. Not only does he look like Peter Weller, but he is fashion forward, a doctor, a daredevil, oh my God. a musician. He's shiny in a way that's not gross. Like there is not an individual more charismatic, more understated, more just magnetically attractive than Buckaroo Banzai. Then wow. you surround him with beautiful boy toys, perfect Tommy specimen. Like, and and so I'm like, how can I express to Sean how perfect this film is if I can't <laughs> even really tell him what the plot is? <laughs> I looked over, I tried to go like, okay, what are the high points of the plot? And I just was reading it on on uh, Wikipedia, and I was like, mm, "None of this feels important." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the things we do in the pre pre show when before we watch the movie is whoever hasn't seen the film tries to guess what the plot is anyway. And I I truthfully like, you know, I couldn't tell you. Like, I didn't know he was a doctor. I imagine he is somebody who has been searching for the eighth dimension. He he stumbled upon it maybe as a child. Like his dad got sucked into the the eighth dimension, and he he made it his lifelong goal to to like I've got to find out how to get back there and find my dad. And it's it's something he he went to school for. He got his PhD, and he he became all these different things, the thrill seeker and, and, and Peter Weller just to find this, this eighth dimension. And when he does it, you know, opens up a door into all, you know, obviously a whole new world, new adventures and new thrills and dangers and things that will challenge him. And maybe he'll find his dad again. Maybe he'll oh, find man. true love. Uh, this is shot, <laughs> my... shot, shot. Have you looked at the cast at all? I, Cause I don't no. want to spoil no. it at all. If you haven't looked. So is the only person in this movie that you're aware of Peter Weller, Peter Weller. And I know, um, is Ellen Burstyn in this? Okay. No, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then. no, I clearly don't know. No. Okay. And, and, and Ellen is in the film, but it's not Burstyn. Okay. Uh, I was close. So, so like you literally do not know a single other person in this movie besides Peter Weller. I couldn't tell you unless I looked at the Wikipedia page, okay. which I won't. Okay, good. Don't. Please don't. Please don't. I mean, the credits will probably spoil it for you, uh, okay. but you just got to let this cast roll over you because it is okay. one of the all-time great casts. And, and you know, like when um, the MCU was like first starting to form and people were going like, how are they going to be able to manage a movie with all the Avengers, Captain America, Hawkeye, Black Widow, Thor, the Hulk. And, and you're like, uh, oh, I wish you could look into the future because the next few Avengers films are going to have like nine times the amount of people. But right. you, you look at Buckaroo Banzai and Buckaroo Banzai has a larger cast than that first Avengers film. And it balances all those personalities and performers perfectly uh and 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 it's like a, a star trek movie too you know you watch wrath of khan the bridge crew's huge but it knows yeah. who's going to be like the standout so there is a tier system within i oh, i almost spoiled the name of uh buckaroo bonsai's people i won't do that <laughs> um, oh, please don't yeah uh, so there is a tier system within the cast but it wait is the name is their name Buckaroonies? No, 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 no. Okay, no. good no. guess though. No, good guess. Thank but you. I'm so glad it's not that. I'm glad it's not 
Uh, and I would also ask that when you watch the film, you watch to the end of the credits because okay. the credits are still oh, very there... much a part of the vibe of the movie. If wow, not the best okay. part of the film. If not the so, best part of the film. <laughs> so we're saying that that Marvel may owe a lot more to no, Rubens. No, no. Oh, okay. What I'm saying is that a good portion of this film's vibe is still in the credits as they're playing. So like, I don't think <laughs> okay. you can have say that you have experienced the whole movie's tone without the credits. That's all I'm saying. Oh my God. To I me, mean, you're like, really hyping it up. What, like you saying like, well, the Marvel universe owes a lot to Buckaroo Banzai. Like it's the exact opposite of that. That's right. Buckaroo yeah, 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 Banzai yeah, no, you're right, you're right. is an untapped cinematic universe. Yes. I would wow. love someone to take the inspiration, the the vibe, that ingenious morsel that is Buckaroo Banzai and just blow it out into something extraordinary. I would love to see Taika Waititi's take on Ooh, the, the Buckaroo Banzai universe. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. I don't know if I'm ready for that. You know what I'm thinking about? And it's just because it's an 80s movie that also kind of like had a whole world that was never truly really explored is Tron, which mm. had a sequel, obviously, in 2000, which I didn't love, Tron Legacy. Oh, but I like, like it. I'm uh, well, I, I had a feeling, I was going to give you a moment to talk about how you liked it because I had a feeling you would. But I, I, I <laughs> but that also original. feels like, like where's the Buckaroo Banzai Legacy, you know? Like it's like, I feel like in terms of a, a creative bonkers world that has poten franchise potential i don't know i don't know maybe this episode will kind of spark a resurgence i would be there day one to watch that film <laughs> but i do not want that film like the oh, the yeah. beauty of the adventures of buckaroo bonsai across the eighth dimension is that it is one bite at the apple Right, it's one okay large bite of a very large apple, uh, <laughs> but you don't get to taste the whole damn thing, and you certainly don't get to go down to the core, right? And that's what's so exciting about this film. Now, you know, the plot stuff is not what's exciting about the film. It's, it's a moot. It's, it's a moot everything point. around the plot, and okay. it is a first time filmmaker kind of movie right so okay you know, it, it, like it, it's not like you're gonna watch this thing and be like wow it's freshly baked right out of the oven and it is perfection it <laughs> has some bents and dents and some unbaked parts to it but that also lends right. to the charm of the film i'm going to tell you this little bit of trivia just so you don't throw it in my face later Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to spoil a visual aesthetic element to this movie. When it went into production, the cinematographer on this film was the Blade Runner cinematographer, Jordan Cronenweth. And wow. His son, Jeff Cronenweth, is the guy who shot Fight Club and Gone Girl and a bunch of David Fincher right. films, right? Like legacy characters. Right. But he was fired. Jordan was fired off the set of this movie and Fred J. Okay. Conan camp came on to shoot the rest of it. And you are going to watch this film and you are going to see a visual shift. <laughs> <laughs> and you're gonna be like, why does this one scene look so damn cool? And the rest of the movie look pretty flat. And that's why I'm, I mean, I am excited. I don't know. I, I, Brad, you've introduced me to so many interesting films on this podcast that like are films that even if my reaction has been, I don't know, like uh, uh, hesitant or less than enthused, I've had such a like, I have such fond memories that it lifts the movie up. Yeah. Like even something like, like Demon Knight, which is not by any means a bad movie, but it's a film that I was like, oh yeah, I enjoyed that as something I look back on and I'm like, oh, that was a blast. And Big Trouble in Little China, of course, too. So I, I'm like, I've learned to keep an open mind with your suggestions. And I have a feeling based on what you've introduced me to, this seems par for the course, but I am so, so curious i think having big trouble in little china in your head will help a little bit like okay. but, oh, lisa's lisa's shaking her head lisa's i i think that it's better to just go in with just a clean slate okay 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 to me i i think that um 
that putting it next to Big Trouble in Little China is not fair. Oh, well, I mean, this is better than Big Trouble in Little China. It's different. Oh, it's different. Oh. Again, this is why your show should be on YouTube, Sean, because Lisa just gave me like, a, mm, Brad's talking crazy. <laughs> well, I'm genuinely excited to watch it. Let's line it. Like, I feel like you guys are like just desperate to actually talk specifics. So let's go ahead and break here. I will go watch it. You will go watch it. We will be back to discuss it. So stay tuned. Now available to own on video cassette. And we're back. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, and by ladies and gentlemen, I mean lady and gentleman. Um, <laughs> the Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. What can I say about this movie? Um, it's wacky as all hell. Uh, it's it's incoherent practically the entire film. Uh, I couldn't tell you what's hap- what happened in the film. Reading a plot description, I think you mentioned, Lisa, in part one, that even trying to process the plot description or like looking at it just makes me more confused. And all that said, it's kind of fantastic. <laughs> Yay! Can't say I didn't it's warn kind you. Of, I mean, yeah, it's true. And it's, you know, this is, it's by no means a perfect movie. Did I love it? I don't know. Uh, I may have loved it more than just straight liking it. Like it okay. is, it's endearing, it's fun. And I think just the sheer carefree, like you're either going with this or you're not vibe of the movie was something I was like, okay, cool. I'm into it. Like it, it, it is from, it is clear from the get go when we start with, with Buckaroo as a brain surgeon and then he's a test pilot and then he's in a rock band. I was like, he's, he is, he is perfect. He is perfect. And I just have to go with this. And then this, when the aliens yeah. show up, mm-hmm. I was like, I, okay, great. With no fanfare. It's just now there are aliens in this movie. Deal with it. So that's the movie in a nutshell is just deal with it. And I dealt with it and, and I enjoyed myself. I think this is a great way to approach Buckaroo Banzai. And it is one of those films where five minutes in maybe 10 minutes, I think the moment John Lithgow shows up as uh, John Warfin <laughs> uh, slash Emilio Lazardo. The I moment knew. he I, appears, I <laughs> you're either with this movie or you're gone. And you're if you continue it, yeah. after his electroshock flashback, you're probably going to have a good time with this film. That's a good deciding point. I think you're right. That is a, a, a that was a moment where I was like, "Oh boy, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> this is happening." And I was with it. Like I, I you know, uh, it. I, I've always said I would rather be like thoroughly entertained by a quote unquote bad movie, which this is not. Um, I would rather be just thoroughly entertained by like the the full on going there than a movie that's more timid and maybe self serious. This this movie's tone is really all over the place Mm -hmm. and i think even peter weller i was reading that when he was being kind of uh invited by richter to join the adventure was like is this what is this is this going to be campy is it going to be like star wars where it's just kind of like very uh heartfelt and straightforward and just goes with it and the movie can't quite decide what it wants to be so it tries to be literally everything it can possibly be and uh it both fails and succeeds but i wouldn't have it any other way if that makes sense when i talk to people about the tone of this film i often say imagine batman 66 just turned one dial up or maybe two dials up in seriousness. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a very good, like it a hundred percent. So that's, that's how I felt overall. It is a, it, it is a movie that like you said, you really have to 
you have to embrace the vibe. And then on top of that, like just the sheer joy of realizing Jeff Goldblum was in the movie, John Lithgow, all these people, all these kind of cult actors from this time period and Ronald Lacey, who I haven't seen in anything other than Indiana Jones as yeah. the president, which is crazy because he's unrecognizable. Yeah. Christopher Lloyd as a, a character named John Big Boutte. Um, <laughs> this is an insane film. <laughs> Mike from Breaking Bad as the guy yeah. gets his neck broken. He gets his neck. There's a lot of neck snapping in this PG rated film. Clancy Brown, Carl Lumley, Isaiah yeah. Bradley from the MCU. Mantis, he's <laughs> in this film. Yes. It's, it is, it was just an embarrassment of riches. And I was really amazed at the caliber of talent, but also everybody is into it. And I was reading, I wasn't sure because this felt like a film that could have been like, if, if I were to have gone and done a little bit of, uh, as Lisa likes to refer to Wikipedia and IMDb <laughs> deep research, if I had mm -hmm. gone to these pages and read, like this was a troubled production, everyone hated it. Everyone was miserable, but that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems like everyone had a blast making this movie. The only people who didn't were like the studio people, like the producers <laughs> who were just at every turn undermining it, like getting rid of Jordan Cronin with, I, when you said he was fired, I thought it was like, Oh, there were like Richter maybe wanted to move faster. And Cronin was like, no, I'm making art and we're going to, but no, it was the producers who came in and said, nah, we want to fire that guy. We want the, we want the movie to look cheaper. <laughs> like, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. And like the Cronin with scenes really do stand apart from everything <laughs> yes. else in the yes, film. Yes, they do. Uh and and I would love to imagine, well I mean I can imagine. I could do that. I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to love to imagine <laughs> what this film would have looked like if Cronin with had stayed on the entire time. And it I think it would be like you know, a little classier maybe, but that kind of shabby look that the film currently has does match the tone of the rest of the movie. Yeah. And, and I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. It, it's, I want the Cronin West version of this movie as any sane film fan would. And the scenes that were definitely shot by him. I know the club scene was shot by him. There's a scene in, I think they're in a vehicle and it's yes. just all blue fluorescence. The I van. was like, well, this, yeah, the van there. I was like, this is very clearly him. Um, again, I would have loved that, but to your point, I don't think, I, I think maybe it would have gained a little bit more respect in the film community. Like maybe people would be more outspoken about this. Like, another Cronin West film like Blade Runner, like they would have been a little bit more like, oh, it's, but it's a cinematic, it looks amazing. But in a way you want that kind of cheapness. You want the, the aliens running around in the really, really obviously rubber suits with, <laughs> with, with rubber hands and things that just, it's like, it doesn't quite work as well if it looks like Blade Runner, it it's needs an to look 80s like B this. movie, right? Like yeah. this is like the, you know, you would watch some Roger Corman film back in the fifties, early sixties. And now we've just transferred it to the eighties. Like that's what Buckaroo Banzai is. I do have a question though, uh, Sean, you okay. mentioned how the plot is incoherent. Now, having watched it many, 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 many times now, I think I have a handle of it. But what to you, what is the plot? What is actually happening in the adventures of Buck Rubanza across the eighth dimension from your point of view, the first time viewer? Uh, well, I will say this, Sarah, who uh, walked into the room every so often, as she does when I'm watching these movies and just gets little glimpses. And she said, I, I wrote this quote down because it was so funny. And I think it describes how I felt about the movie. She said, every time I look at the screen, it's a completely different plot. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, that is, that's how I felt. So, I mean, obviously Buckaroo Banzai is a, a, a brain, is he a brain surgeon? Neurosurgeon. He's, he's a, yes. Yeah. He's a neurosurgeon. He is a, a scientist. He is a, a, a test pilot. 
Mm-hmm. He's in a rock band. He's kind of a samurai. Mm-hmm. He's is it? Ha- he's half Japanese. He, clearly, he's half <laughs> Japanese. I mean, his hair is black, so obviously he's. half If Japanese. you watch the deleted scenes, Jamie Lee Curtis plays his mother. I was reading about that. So there's even more lore about Buckaroo Banzai that was ex- excised from the film because the producers were like, no, we don't want to remotely hint that there could possibly be more of these, even though the movie ends with like an actual call out to a sequel that never happened, which is Sad. great. Um, but I, so he is, he's just a man of many trades. Lisa, I, you put it beautifully in part one of the episode, just talking about like he is, he's, he's practically perfect in every way like he really is and so he has a band that is also like his his super posse like i guess they're all i don't know if they're part of his scientific community as they are well, all doctors they are all doctors they're, they're they are all doctors okay so they just like hang out go on adventures together uh, it doesn't have to doesn't have to make sense the movie makes makes no attempts to make it make but sense. what's the I mean, plot it, sean so i'm, tr- I'm trying us to, a lot of colorful details i'm <laughs> trying to get to that and i and i the the okay so they they're trying to get to the eighth dimension uh and then they bring something back with them john lithgow uh is who had been there many years prior is triggered by this, this breakthrough. He goes insane. Buckaroo Banzai apparently is like a well-known celebrity who works mm-hmm. with the president mm-hmm. and is, is part of uh, these, these experiments to try to get to the eighth dimension. What, what is the eighth dimension? I couldn't tell you. I don't know what is so exciting about it or what they're hoping to accomplish. If they said it, I can't remember. Like, is it the secret to like, life on earth or like i don't know why they're trying to get there but they're trying to it get got there. explained then, i think pretty clearly sean in well, the press I, I, scene <laughs> where well, all of the questions well. were answered yeah there was a point there was a point where i was like am i because buckaroo bonsai jumps from persona like you know sometimes he's wearing glasses and mm-hmm. all dressed up and sometimes he's got a headband on so there was a point where i was like maybe the movie is is intercutting the different dimensions maybe buckaroo bonsai is a different is a different role in every dimension and then i realized like no he's just everything possible you could need him to be in order to not even necessarily move the plot forward like the samurai stuff like his his japanese heritage really doesn't come into play much so i i can't say whether or not like you needed all that stuff, but I'm so glad it's there. How does I'm, I'm, Planet re- 10 factor into the plot, Sean? This okay, so Plan- Planet 10. So there, I know there's a there's a guy from Planet 10 who's a good guy. Like He comes and he's like, I mean you no harm. I want to help Lumley, you. Carl John Parker. Yes. Yes, yes. So he's like, I want to help you. And they're like, great. And he helps them. And Planet mm. 10, uh, they're the bad guys. They want to... Mm. They wanna- <laughs> destroy the planet i really i i couldn't tell you i one of them is christopher lloyd and and everyone right. calls him big booty and he uh-huh. keeps correcting them it's and big saying bootay. it's big booty yep um yeah would you like me to tell I you don't. what the plot of this movie tell is me, please for the love of god I stop ma- oh, dangling okay. it in front right. of me all right all right Lisa's embarrassing gonna... me in front of my listeners all like, right. okay all right. just all tell right. me lisa's gonna give it a shot I, i'm going please, to tell Lisa. you because i did say in the introduction that the plot was incomprehensible. And um, and then I just proved myself r- wrong by doing the impossible and comprehending this film. So, wow, okay. <laughs> so um, what is going on? So the eighth dimension. So the eighth dimension is the dimension that exists in the empty space between our solid matter. Mm-hmm. So do you remember mm-hmm. from the press scene, The Rock? So The Rock to us seems like solid matter, but it is in fact mostly empty space, which we will learn from an, a later classic film, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Mm-hmm. It's the same principle, uh, right? Okay. We're made mostly of empty space. Now in this empty space, Planet 10 has been using the eighth dimension on Earth as a prison for an oppressed race. 
The red electroids. The red electroids. Okay. okay. <laughs> when, um, when Dr. Lazardo was pulled into the eighth dimension, it boggled his mind to the degree that he became John Warfin. Well, oh, no, no, no. No, no excuse no. me. Let me walk that back. <laughs> he was replaced yes. by John Warfin. Yeah, yeah. And John so, Warfin so escaped Lizardo the eighth dimension. In, yeah. And um, John Warfin was pulled out. Yes, okay. yes. Hence the hair color change. Exactly. Now, okay. okay. Um, once the overthruster, the oscillating overthruster, the oscillating overthruster, not to be confused with the flux <laughs> capacitor, was invented. <laughs> we have There's now- a lot of Back to the Future stuff in this movie. I just uh, say. Back to the Future stuff ripped off from Buckaroo Banzai. We have. I, now, I will agree with that. Yeah. By breaching the eighth dimension, we have now potentially done this intergalactic upset. Yes. Releasing. Um, the red lectroids. So the black lectroids were like, hey, we realized you didn't know what you were doing, but now you have threatened not only the existence of our planet, but now also the existence of Earth. Yes. And so they, the, the black lectroids from Planet 10, are threatening to fire a particle beam on Moscow igniting a right, nuclear right. war, war III, with America, yep. which will then destroy the planet. Unless they get John Warfin back in the eighth dimension or they take care of him somehow. And, and then in the, in the midst of all of this, they, they, what I love is that they, they bring Orson Welles war of the worlds yes. into it and say like, mm-hmm. that was real. It happened. And Orson Welles had to be convinced to he tell was people it was a lie. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then, um, there, there's kind of an inexplicable love story in the film, which is fantastic. I love also how the love interest is introduced in the film. Um, that Buckaroo, Buckaroo Banzai is such a stand-up guy that he can tell when someone in his audience is not enjoying the music he and his band are playing. And he, because he I stops think everything. What I realized on this watch, another, dare I say, dimension to oh. Buckaroo Banzai is that he is a true empath. So when he is brought onto the planet by his parents, when he is born, he fulfills their dream by becoming this brilliant scientist. But then he meets these guys who want to start a band and he goes, absolutely, I'll start a band with you. I am going to now meet your expectation and then they expect him to be this really cool guy so now all of a sudden he's doing these daredevil tricks and so when he experiences sadness he can or or um a lack of completeness as an empath he can sense it from feet away well but do you all did you also pick up that she is the long lost sister to his first wife. That's right. Yeah, I, That's right. I couldn't Hence tell her suicidal nature because yes. she has always been feeling this lack of her sister. Right. So I, I thought like I was like, maybe this has something to do with the eighth dimension and this will be explained. But no, it is just like, oh, no, your dead wife's long lost twin sister. And there's like a moment where she finds the photo in his room and is yeah. like, I don't understand. And he's basically like don't worry about it and she's like okay and that's the end of that too so it's it's very very fascinating there are many many things thrown at the viewer all at once very quickly dismissed and you're kind of just like wait am i what is it am i uh, uh," and then they throw jeff goldblum up on screen in a cowboy outfit and i'm like okay i'm i'm fine i'm fine now this is good (laughs) i'm going with this i understand completely i uh i also appreciate there there are so many like the movie isn't quite camp like it's not embracing camp like it is campy but it's sincere yes. in its intentions in the same way something like star wars is it's just vastly more absurd and ridiculous but things like the uh I, <laughs> and this is great and i loved actually realizing what this moment is in the movie for but like little moments that just are are so such 
insane like winking to the audience moments but the watermelon moment where he's yes. like why is there a watermelon here and he goes i'll tell you later and they just leave and they never mention it ever ever again that was one of my favorite parts of the whole movie and looking on wikipedia i am i'm reading that uh, apparently that was an attempt on the filmmakers part to just see if they were being checked by the producers anymore because the producers were really, really hands-on and then they stopped being hands-on. So they shot that scene as a way to test whether or not they were going to make them cut it out. And when they didn't, they were like, Oh, okay, we can just do whatever we want now, but it's also one of the best scenes in the movie. Yeah. And the reason it's the, one of the best scenes of the movie is because it's indicative of what makes Buckaroo Banzai so interesting. You know, Jeff Goldblum's New Jersey says like, what's the deal with the watermelon? And Nevada goes like, I'll tell you later. And it's like the whole film is that way. You, you <laughs> yeah. see all this stuff <laughs> and you know that it's there for a reason, but you don't know why it's a reason. It's like hinting at this massive world that you could find if you would go around the corners, but you're stuck within the frames of this film. And what, you get with Buckaroo Banzai is this uh, suggested universe that you never get full access to. And it's right there in that watermelon scene. Yes. That's what I felt too, is that sense of what you were talking about earlier, where it's like, there is a world here. There are major ideas here that will never be explored, but it's also just as a punchline. Like I, I yeah, it's so funny. Like, it's just such a funny moment because it is that acknowledgement to the audience of like, you really just need to go with this. And I mean, it's about an hour into the movie. So by that point, if you're not into it, you're done. But like, I, <laughs> I loved that so, so much. There's some, I mean, there's a lot to love about the movie. I think despite the fact that it is really, it, it totally is something you have to kind of, be on board with like sure. it's not necessarily something that i think and i think you were hinting at this too but it's something where i i wouldn't be surprised that people hated it or that people like it didn't quite i know it had deep competition but it's a film that i don't know how you market it i don't know who it's for really um but like i feel like if i had seen this now i would have been like everyone's going to hate this but in a few years people are going to be talking about it and how much they love it it just it reeks of cult status to me i feel like buckaroo bonsai like you mentioned that it's not camp and i and i 100% agree i don't think that it is camp i think that it is fashion in that like <laughs> it like it throughout the film it is gesturing to an, an awareness of the outside world. It gestures to awareness of, you know, ultimate nuclear destruction. It gestures towards an awareness of, oh, there's um, race discrepancies and, and there is injustice. Right. And it gestures towards the idea that Buckaroo Banzai can be this extraordinarily cool and also deeply intelligent person. And it goes like, and that's enough, right? Yeah. Doesn't it look cool? Don't you want to hang out with these people? Don't you want to kind of dress like a cowboy now? Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> yes. Yes. I do. It and is I funny though. Like it, the movie does like, seems like it takes place in some future age, but it's also like kind of referencing the Cold War mm -hmm. and like the, the Orson Welles broadcast is something that's like, ah, the not too distant past. Like it is, it's a weird alternate future, mm -hmm. but it's not the future. It's I, I don't quite I, again. It's it's hard to to put your finger on. You know what, what it's it is trying for to do. me is how steampunk extends out of Jules Verne imagining the future from his fixed point in time. Buckaroo Banzai imagines a future that is rooted in the cold war that is rooted in 80s america i i guess i can see that it's it's just it makes no apologies for it it doesn't explain it away it doesn't need to explain it away it's just what it is and yeah. i was here for it and i just and it made me so sad that like i i agree i don't necessarily want more of these because i think just the sheer fact that this is a singular effort 
that exists on its own terms that there weren't any sequels that there wasn't it, that even though that was clearly the intention there never was anything else enriches this movie and makes it all the more hilarious and endearing but it does kind of make me sad because it's clear everyone is having a ball and that makes me want to see more of these adventures i don't know like is it is how do you both feel about it i know you feel like there shouldn't be sequels but is there a part of you that's like i would have liked to have seen maybe one more thing with this group I mean, I would love to read a comic book series based on these characters. I like to me, I go like, would I necessarily need to follow Buckaroo Banzai specifically? No, but I would love to see what New Jersey is up to (laughs) right now. (laughs) Right, right. So, like, for for me, I don't want to see a modern filmmaker do their version of Buckaroo Banzai against the World Crime League. Of course, I would have loved to have lived in a world where this film was successful and we did get a series of sequels the way that we got Star Trek sequels, right? Like, you know, I would be happy yes. with this crew making nine Buckaroo Banzai movies. Yes, absolutely. The idea of doing a comic <laughs> book. I think that is fun. They've done it. They're OK. They don't ever quite <laughs> capture the magic of this film. I always had this kind of fan fiction if I had ever been given Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill's The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, that I would do an 80s based team, a league in which Perfect Tommy is the <laughs> Mia of the group, is the leader. <laughs> and we learned that like Buckaroo Banzai died at some point, and Perfect Tommy has oh, to wow. carry on his heroism, lacking Banzai's intelligence and celebrity. Oh that, man, that's Brad Gullickson writing a, a mashup sequel with uh, Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill's *The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen*. Lisa, is there, Lisa, is there a particular thing you would want to see in a Buckaroo Banzai sequel? Do you agree with that? Do you like Brad's idea, or are you like, no, I need Buckaroo in my in my future movies? Um, to me, I think the way to take Buckaroo Banzai, like, I, it would have to stay in the 80s and stay in the Cold War era. But I would like to see what other kinds of adventures they go on. I would like to see something like episodic. And I'd like to see more of the interaction Hmm. of the individual characters. Like, I find Buckaroo's relationship with Perfect Tommy to be so interesting because Perfect Tommy is also a scientist and he's also a musician, <laughs> but for some reason, it, if someone has to be the butt of the joke, it is Perfect Tommy. My favorite <laughs> Perfect Tommy moment is when they are getting uh, uh, Penny out of jail, and Tommy's there with Buckaroo, and like a prostitute in the next cell is like, oh my God, it's Perfect Tommy. <laughs> like that's how huge their celebrity is. And like at the motorcycle convention, when Buckaroo Banzai steals the bike, the, the guy on the back of the truck off screen ADR is like, that's Buckaroo Banzai. Like I yeah. love I re- the celebrity around these characters within this world. But Perfect Tommy not wanting to let Penny out. Like he, he's like, this is not Penny. What are you doing? This is not... You, you know, this is not your old, your former love. Like this is this is absurd. Don't do this. And then Buckaroo's like, "Give her her, ja- give her your jacket." And he's like, well, "Why am I going to do that?" And he's like, "Because you're perfect." And he does. He gives her a jacket. <laughs> I think that I think that Perfect Tommy is genuinely concerned that he's going to lose his place. Yes, yes. And I think mm. that he's afraid that Penny is going to replace her. And that, replace ten- him. that tension is sort of there also between Perfect Tommy and Rawhide, played by Clancy Brown. Mm-hmm. And and when Rawhide is killed and he's dying, you know, like the, 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 the saddest scene in the whole movie, um, watching Perfect Tommy in that sequence and watching how um lewis smith performs that sequence i think is uh like a tiny delight that this movie carries and i think lewis smith is really great and i wish we got more movies from him other than buck rubanzai and the heavenly kid i know know he's done other stuff but like those two movies were so important to my youth 
he's such a huge figure. I want the rest of the world to understand how awesome Lewis Smith is. And they, they haven't quite figured it out yet. I get I, I, the way I interpret it is that Perfect Tommy was the last person to become part of the Hong Kong Cavaliers, but before it has New Jersey. before New Jersey, mm. but it has been literally like two to three years. Mm, mm. And he has dealt with being the new kid for two to three years. Yeah. And then suddenly there's two new people in the group. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I would like a little more background on these other previous characters. Like I get That's the sense what I want too, yeah. that Rawhide is like Buckaroo Banzai's like childhood yeah, friend. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Sean, do you, like looking at this massive, weird, and wonderful cast, is there a supporting <laughs> player or a supporting performance that you sort of gravitated toward that you wanted more of? Well, I wanted more of all of them, really. I mean, obviously, I mean, Jeff Goldblum is immediately, I'm like, I just want more of him in all of my movies. But I think, like, listening to you two talk about the kind of the the backgrounds of these characters, which are not necessarily 100% clear. Like, it's not like, it. basically, the gang is there to support Buckaroo. Like, they're all kind of, they're all colorful. They all have personalities, but it's basically him saying, we've got to go do this. And they're kind of like, all right, whatever you say, Buckaroo. And I wanted, as you guys are talking more about, like, oh, I wish I, wa- I wanted more of that. I wanted more of their background. That's kind of what I was thinking, too, is I wanted to have a little bit more of this this really cool gang of characters. Why did they get together? Do I need the explanation? I don't really know. It's kind of amazing that they just are who they are but i wanted a little bit more feeling of like what are the dynamics there what you're suggesting with like that power play between rawhide and uh, perfect tommy it would have been like it's it's there now that you're saying it i'm like oh yeah i can see that but it would have been nice to get a little bit more layers to it like it, the movie feels because it's trying to stuff so much into this this hour and 45 minute runtime there's stuff left by the wayside like maybe a little bit more depth to these relationships that i wanted but as far as um the effectiveness goes and as far as the the enjoyment i get out of watching them and all the different characters i mean perfect tommy was great but i i it's just it's new jersey is my favorite strictly because he's jeff goldblum (laughs) to me it goes like what is more fun knowing why the watermelon is there or wondering why the yeah, watermelon right. is there. So to me, I like. I think that this movie exists to um, to make you curious. Like they're putting this beautiful feast in front of you and not letting you taste it. Yeah. Like it's going like you're just salivating yeah. <laughs> and going like, I want to know everything, and yet they leave you wanting more. Yeah. Like to me, I I'm definitely like. Um, um, I, I, I'm happy to, to just be curious about the watermelon. And it is one of those movies that does give you enough to really appreciate the performances that we have. Right. And like to Jeff Goldblum in particular, like this is a really interesting period in his career, right? Like this is what, this is 1984. He's coming off of films like the right stuff invasion of the body snatchers. Thank God it's Friday, you know, cool movies, but tiny roles in it. Here's another tiny role. He's two years away from the fly in 1986, but you can sense in New Jersey that there is a star getting ready to erupt. Yes. A hundred percent. I would also say that like, you know, Jeff Goldblum took that charisma that you see in Buck Rubanzai and he made it happen for himself. Whereas like, I think it's also there in Lewis Smith. I think it's also there in Pepe Sarna and they would go on and have great careers, but for whatever reason, luck and blah, 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 they, they don't get what Jeff Goldblum gets. But when you look at Lewis Smith, when you look at Pepe Sarna as Reno Nevada in this movie, you definitely come away going like, yeah, I need more of those guys. I think that's it. I think it's the charisma that makes you automatically like you can't help but want more of this. You can't help but want more explanation or things like that. But I agree, Lisa. I I, I think the beauty of the movie is that it doesn't it's not going to give you everything you want. If there was more, it almost takes away from just this big hodgepodge of kind borderline incoherent 
storytelling and world building and characters like you just kind of have to go with it and i i kind of love that and i appreciate that it's just the sheer fact of like charismatically i want more of these people in general and i want to see more of them and that's that's what i i don't know it's like i i don't take anything away from the movie for being what it is and for not delving deeper but there's a part of me that's just like oh i i like the ends the end credits which I'm so glad you, I, I probably would have watched anyway because I was so stunned and mesmerized that I was like, <laughs> I need to, I will not stop watching until the movie is completely done playing. But th- just watching them and like walking through this, this wherever they are in LA and and moving through and walking in beat with the music, it, it just is like this, I wanted more of this. I want more <laughs> I can't help but want more, even though I fully appreciate that there is no more. And that's kind of why this movie works the way it does. It makes it, you want it, to have like the Buckaroo Banzai musical. Can yeah. I just get that? I would love that. I would love that. Or I just want that poster of on my wall of them all lined up. It actually, it reminded it me that, <laughs> does it, re- oh, I, I, that doesn't surprise me in the slightest, but it did, it just had like, I felt like the life aquatic with Steve Zizou totally owes something to Buckaroo Banzai, including Jeff Goldblum. Oh yeah. Um, but like, I it mean, just, that scene, had... like that, that scene is reproduced in the life aquatic. I mean, that is a exactly. direct homage to Buck Banzai. Yeah, exactly. And I just, th- that same charm, that same uh, joyous kind of celebration of everything. This movie is the, the kind of, it, it's a moment where it's like, fully acknowledging to the audience like yes this movie was that ridiculous but we again these guys are not winking at the camera they are completely committed they're walking in tune to the crazy synthesized music and it's great and i loved that and i loved the the i love just the gusto of everyone involved the enthusiasm the love for this this non-franchise but clearly there was something there and people the people involved really really loved what they were doing and that just makes me again that just makes me like oh i want to see more of that and it's a shame that i don't think richter directed much else outside of this as far as i can he did late for dinner in 1991 but other than that he kind of retreated to writing big trouble in little china was after buckaroo bonsai and I yeah. mean, he I, is the credited writer on the Jamie Foxx classic Stealth. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And then nothing, nothing else. Says. Like, well, he also wrote uh, a film that Lisa and I enjoy, a Stephen King adaptation called Needful Things mm. with Ed Harris and Max oh. Foncino. That's a fun movie. Uh, and that's worth watching. But there's nothing okay. like... Buckaroo Banzai in his film. Yeah, it's just well, I mean, Big it, Trouble in Little China is a little bit maybe. Yeah, I I I do see some overlap there a little bit, but like, it's just such a shame. Like this this isn't even a movie where it's like, yeah, stick with writing, buddy. Like it's like there is intention. It's a little clunky, but overall, like there's there's ambition, there's intention, and there's a sense of like somebody relatively confident for their first time directing a film that has so many moving pieces, even though it doesn't cohere completely, even though it's not a complete success, it just, it does make me want to see not only more Buckaroo Banzai, but also like, Oh, I wish WD Richter had maybe done more. It's a shame that the movie wasn't a success and that he probably kind of was, he retreated to lick his wounds and go back to, exclusively screenwriting but. i don't have it in front of me but i believe that he and earl mac roush the screenwriter collaborated mm. on an expanded novelization and i think dark horse comics just published a new edition of it which yeah, i have not got my hands on that yet well. but i'm going to get it let me see I want to look this up because I would like to see more of this too, but I do remember reading that as well. And that's, you know, I, I, I would enjoy a comic. I'd enjoy, you know, other platforms, other outlets as far as like, Oh, comic books, video games. Yeah. Why not? Let's do a whole thing. But there's just something about the film itself and seeing it in live action that I don't think 
I don't I think the experience is muted if it is consumed in other ways if that makes sense like it's like it's it's well i'll take mm. what i can get but also i'm like no oh, i would have loved that that other one. what was this what was the sequel going to be called against the world crime league which dark horse against- comics <laughs> has done an adaptation or That's a version of and yes. the novel isn't with wd richter but it is by earl mac roush so that I'll, I will read it. I will uh, get a kick out of it, I'm sure. And it'll just make me wish that we'd gotten the movie. The top well. quote but, on the back of the book is, uh, quote, I speak Spanish to God, French to women, English to men, and Japanese to my horse, Buckaroo Banzai. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything you two picked up from this latest viewing that, stuck out to you things that I know Lisa you had a, it seems like you had a kind of a breakthrough with the plot but is there anything else that stood out to you this time around well for me watching it having just also watched Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness which Sean have mm. you watched that movie yet you have not no I still haven't seen um, it Ugh. I don't want to spo- like I don't want to spoil something. I won't. I'm not going to spoil Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. But if you go okay. to my Twitter at <laughs> mouthdork, uh the way Buckaroo Banzai is written and performed by Peter Weller in this movie is the way I would like a certain future Marvel character to be handled mm-hmm. in the MCU. Uh, oh my God. how his intelligence and his ability or inability to connect with humanity, I think would fit this character really well. And okay. um, uh, don't spoil Dr. Strange in the multiverse of madness, Brad. Uh, <laughs> there was something about the way that, that scene later on in Buckaroo Banzai, when Penny discovers the picture of his, of his dead wife and the way that he could not be bothered with this moment, like the way that Buckaroo Banzai is like, look, the world is going to explode. I do not have time to deal with your feelings, woman. Like, like it's there's a cruelty to his inability to handle that very human scene that I think is really interesting and is critical to this MCU slash Marvel character that I'm talking about. And God, I really should have seen Dr. Strange. I, you know, we you know, part it's, two of this as well. I mean, I agree with, I that. didn't realize it was going to be prerequisite viewing for part two of the it, th- this episode, particular but... character has been on my mind a lot. And a version <laughs> of that character shows up in Dr. Strange. And it's a character so, that so, I cherish but, deeply. But if people want to delve into this, they can go to Mouth Dork and, At Mouth and Dork, find more information. And they, and they okay. got to go back like 10 or 12 tweets, depending on <laughs> when you're listening or, to this. But, but it'll be worth it. But it'll, it'll be, be worth, worth it. it. It'll be but worth Lisa, it. what do you think? Is, aside from the plot, is there anything else you picked up from this latest viewing? I am in love with my idea of Buckaroo Bondi being this tremendous empath. And he has this compulsion to fulfill other people's expectations for him to make them feel better. Which is an interpretation that's kind of in the exact opposite yeah, which is of the opposite my of version. What Brad just said. <laughs> but like in in past watches, I have not enjoyed the character of Penny because in this crew of like slick guys, there is like this one hysterical woman. Yeah. And um and her introduction is not problematic, you know. It's not unproblematic. I mean, <laughs> it's it's not, kind of amazing though, because first of all, he f- first of all, Buckaroo stops the music to talk to this woman who is just out of her mind, and it cuts away. He's singing a ballad for her, and when it cuts back to her, she has a gun pointed to her head, and I'm I'm watching this just flabbergasted, like what. <laughs> Is this movie? What is happening? What is going on? I just want to point that out. Like it was just, it was kind of hysterical. I um, interpret that scene as that was her plan for the evening. Mm-hmm. She didn't yeah. anticipate it being the center of attention, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but then she is offered this gesture that was intended to be like this compassionate thing, but then 
ultimately just kind of highlighted how how much extraordinary pain she was in mm. and um but then throughout the film once she finds out like oh my feeling of feeling incomplete makes sense like i my sister was taken away from me and that was unfair and then yeah. she got the opportunity just unquestionably to just be part of this family. And then all of a sudden her latent brilliance to understand, you know, uh, quirks or whatever. I don't even, I can't even <laughs> like her, her, her ability to understand <laughs> the eighth dimension, something Sean mm -hmm. couldn't even do in the context <laughs> of a press conference. And then she ultimately makes herself really, useful but then but then she's like and i'm now willing to die for this cause it's, it's it becomes a damsel in distress it like, it, it really it, is well, a yes, lot yeah, she yeah. really is a lot but to me this is the first time i've felt the most compassion for her mm -hmm. at, from the context of um mm, the buckaroo bonsai going like can i resolve this for this person i i don't know I don't know. I like, yeah. I still have complicated feelings around her character, but um, I feel like with subsequent wa watches, I will get there. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a question for you too. So the, the quote, no matter where you go, there you yes. are. Is that, or does that originate with this film? Yes. Or is this quote, I'm, is that I'm really? pretty darn sure. I'm pretty Cause darn I looked sure. it up cause I wanted to be sure. And there is, this is what pops up when I Google it. And I'm like, wait, did that come from this movie? That's I mean, pretty so amazing. If you, uh, uh, like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, if you go to quoteinvestigator.com, which I have just done, it says <laughs> that the comical saying was circulating by 1955 when it was attributed to Jim Russell within a student publication at Pennsylvania State University in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. The popularity of the adage increased when it appeared in the film Buckaroo Banzai in 1984. So why is that quote there? Why did this quote from this Pennsylvania State University paper appear in er uh, Earl Mac Roush's script? I have no idea. We need to get an interview. Can we talk about yeah, what it means to, to each out. of us? Yeah, what yeah. does that quote mean to you, Sean? Have you have you been trying to sit with it and interpret it? Well, no, it's just the, it, it, it amazed me that this is conceivably the film or the thing that spawned that quote like despite what we're looking but up what is this, the function? whatever the website is like what is the function the, of the quote in that scene in that scene i guess he's just saying like you're meant to be here like this is where you're supposed mm -hmm. to be like this is you like you know you she is distraught she is upset she feels like her life has no meaning and he's basically reassuring her like you are where you are supposed to be like this is, yeah. it's going to be okay. That's what I got from that. That's what the quote has always meant to me. It's like, no matter where you go, there you are. Like you'll, you can't escape yourself. So you might as well just embrace it and be okay with it and accept it. Yeah. I think I'm sort of along the same lines a little bit there. What I like about its placement in that scene in the movie is here is a crowd that has shown up just to see the Hong Kong Cavaliers and Buckaroo Banzai perform. They want the hits. <laughs> the Stones are here. The Beatles are here. Play the hits. And here's this real bummer of a woman breaking up the show. <laughs> and you hear them mock her audibly. And th I love, like, the, 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 the highlight of the scene for me isn't that quote. It's Buckaroo Banzai saying, hey, 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 don't be, don't be cruel. Don't be cruel. Yeah. And yeah. that leads into like, remember, you know, no matter where you go, there you are. And what I get from that scene is him telling his audience, like, we're all, we're, we're all doing the best we can. We're mm -hmm. all living mm -hmm. our lives. And you want to remember that this is the moment you're living this moment. And this person's mm -hmm. living that moment. It's not just about the self. It's about the other and how there are no others. Hmm. Yeah. Like, to me, like the way, like, I do find it extraordinarily touching that he holds back the jeers and discontent. I also think, like, the way I interpret it in that context is, like, sometimes you will end up in situations that seem to be contrary to your character. 
Like she mm -hmm. might be sitting there thinking like, you know, like this was not the plan. My plan for my life was not to be unhappy in a crowd of joy, joyous people crying into <laughs> my open bottle. Like that was not the plan. And yet I had like, but this is still me, you know, and I still mm -hmm. have to like, it does, it doesn't matter if it's outside of the plan or outside of your character to be in a place you don't want to be. And we can all get there. Like we can yeah, all any, any one of us, like I, I am a notorious public crier. I've <laughs> cried in many a Barnes and Noble, <laughs> a couple targets. It got to the point where I could like my radius of Panera's, that I had not cried in was just too far. I'm like, I can't pick two anymore. I just can't because I've cried in all of the Paderas. That's so true. It is 100% the case. And so to me, I go like, you know, you can't fight the situation that you're in. Even if you don't want to accept it, and even if it was not part of your plan, and even if it's mm. contrary to your character, you still have to accept it because that is where you are. I, I think, like it. I mm -hmm. think a lot of our yeah. like personal discontents come from that feeling of like, I shouldn't be here. Yeah. The fighting right. of where you are. Like, you know, like my past, my past self did things that screwed me in the present <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. unfair. And, um, and like, to me, like when I first saw that scene, I was like, what a vapid thing to say to this person who is clearly in distress. <laughs> and he to... gets her name wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, it it is so much. But I think the more that I like, pu like put myself in the place of Penny and go like, like to not only be in your worst moment, but to have a spotlight put on it and have to make sense of it. Like it, it is really a gesture towards something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like all that, Lisa. I, I like all of that too. I think it's true. I think it, but I it's also, wasn't so loud. I'm like yeah, squishing well, around I think in the a chair. chair. The chair adds to the moment. No matter I where I go, and my I, chair is so there's noisy. Your chair. On mic. <laughs> <laughs> there your chair. Um, I, I think it definitely feels like a, a, it's it's the moment where the movie has co basically been compounding all these ridiculous things. You're kind of trying to keep up and saying, okay, we're in a rock band now. What is happening? And it's a moment of utter, and the way Peter Weller performs it, it's utterly sincere and heartfelt. And it's a moment where I, me as a viewer watching for the first time is kind of like, the movie is sort of tongue in cheek, but that that felt very sincere and this feels heartfelt, even though what's happening on screen is utterly absurd in many, many ways. When and he breaks out that tiny working. trumpet. It's a cornet yes. and it's a real yes. instrument. Don't saying. shame <laughs> cornet players at their teeny tiny I'm sorry. horns. I'm sorry, that teeny tiny <laughs> horn. And he rocks it so hard. It's really beautiful. It's Lisa. just, you can it's just. Size does not matter, Brad. I've been told. You, you told Quit me many shaming times. shaming people. <laughs> I just all I'm saying is like this it, to have that kind of very quiet like everybody quiet down like let's help this lady and to say that and to just have that moment kind of sit is it was it's so strange but this movie is like it's like a, a constant contradiction but mm. it its intentions are so pure that it it doesn't feel cynical mm. or snide or sarcastic it's just like this is what it is. You know, you're here. We're here. It's going to be fun. We're going to get through this. That's how I felt watching the movie overall. Like no matter what, I was just kind of like, I'm okay. I'll just take me there. Whatever we're doing. I'm not going to question it. Let's do it. And I feel like by the less resistance, the more you will enjoy. I wonder how the actors felt once they saw it all cut together. Like, yeah. I wonder if they go like, I can't wait to see this movie when it all comes together. It's just going to make the most sense. <laughs> like they're all doing it like this is going to be the next Star Wars. This is so cool. Um, I've never looked so slick. I've never said lines so smart. I've never had a scene in a bar with a tiny horn so deep. I can't wait until this is all pulled together. And then what did they think when they saw the final 
the final film. Yeah, I don't know. Film. I don't know. Like, I, 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 there's there's yeah. a lack of, like, I really, you know, and I don't have the Blu-ray. I don't, you know, I will never own the Blu-ray unless Shout deems it necessary to uh, reprint it. It but, deserves a reprint. Uh, I, I, oh, yeah. Yeah, Criterion. I would love to see. Yeah, Criterion. Come on, Criterion. I would love to see the interviews and, and hopefully some... Um, retrospective interviews with the cast where they talk about like seeing it and the reactions to the film or the lack thereof and the the general consensus at the time and how they felt because they, again like i said there's a clear commitment on the part of all the cast members and a sense of fun like there isn't a lot of contention as far as like reading the stories of the production like i could see this going very badly but it seems like the spirit of the production is very much in line with the spirit of the film, which is just wacky, fun, people enjoying themselves and just going along with with it. Like it 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 that makes me happy and it makes me want more. It makes me want like that that whatever. What year how long ago was this? 84? So we're at like the third almost the 40th yeah. anniversary in a few years, 40th anniversary. I mean, can we get a 40th anniversary cast reunion and get some stories told? Richter's still around. I mean, he's not making movies anymore. He's got time to spare at a convention. Come on. Like, I want to know. We did meet Peter Weller one time at a Star Trek convention. And, you know, he was there signing mostly 8 by 10s for Star Trek Into Darkness, the evil admiral that he plays in that movie. <laughs> uh, and But he did have some 8 by 10s of Buckaroo Banzai. And, of course, Aww. Lisa and I were like, you know, can not only we were like, can you sign the Buckaroo Banzai? Can you put the no matter where you go <laughs> quote? There you are on oh my it. God. And he he was very charming, and we had just seen a screening of the film at the Alamo Draft House in Ashburn, and we told him about it, and he was like shocked. Yeah, he was like, "You just saw this on the big like. When did you see this on the big screen?" I was like, "A week ago, sir," <laughs> and uh, he was delighted by it. Now. I did call him Mr. Weller and he immediately oh. corrected me with a Dr. Weller. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not joking. <laughs> I wouldn't expect nothing less. That but that doesn't like I feel like the movie is kind of an inside joke that they I think everyone probably knew deep down like how are you I was reading a, a John Lithgow was saying like you know, how do you market this film? Like it, th there is no specific audience for this movie. You can't explain what this movie is really. Like it's, it's incredibly hard to try. Um, I feel like maybe deep down they knew it, hence the surprise, but I, I feel like that was a moment where you, you bonded with him, where he knew he recognized you, you recognized him and you shared that moment and you knew, you knew each other. Peter Weller does play the trumpet. Wow. It says he was, a, um, I looked, uh, did some deep research on Wikipedia, <laughs> and it says while enrolled at North, North Texas State University, now the University of North Texas, he played trumpet in one of the campus bands. Okay, there you go. So this is that's his tiny trumpet. So, so no they, matter where you go, that's why he got the job. There's your tiny trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> and he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Theater. I'm trying to see when he wow. got his doctorate. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, it's in Italian Renaissance art yeah. history. I'm yeah. sure that's come up a ton. Uh, he wow. did a whole docuseries on the History Channel uh, using wow. that knowledge. And um, yeah, he's a smart guy. And he's on Cameo now. <laughs> Ooh. Listen, make sure. No matter where sure. you go, send him 30 bucks. <laughs> And please, please do address him as doctor. He will. He will tell he will you flip. otherwise. <laughs> is there anything else? Is there are there any other questions I, for me that have not been answered? I did have a stroke of genius. I wish I had a question. It okay. doesn't seem like I'm not a generous no, no, no. person by not having a question. No, no, no. But Let's do you it. know who I would allow? That's a question. <laughs> to continue. <laughs> do you know my th thoughts on who? It the one director that I would allow. Well, one of two. One of two. Because I said last time I was like Taika Waititi's take on. He's a Taika, oh, yeah. yeah. Taika would yeah. be great. But uh, no, um, I think that I would love to see Denis Villeneuve's. Oh, no. Pucker Ponce. <laughs> yes, because he's got the fashion sense. That's true. He's got okay, the aesthetic. Okay. He's got the self-seriousness. He does have that. 
but he doesn't yeah. have the whimsy. There is some whimsy in Buckaroo. Yeah, Banzai. he doesn't. He's not quite joyful enough. I feel I, like. I like. I know. Banzai I'm into movie. it. A dark. Oh no. Broody, <laughs> high fashion. Uh, the Buckaroo Zack Banzai. Snyder reboot. No. Oh, I almost man. said the F word. I was specifically told not to say. Not that one. Just the regular one. Anyway. <laughs> F you. <laughs> yeah, I got Brad it. Brad Gullickson. I, got it. Got I it. think he that this it. is yep. a great idea. Okay. Yeah. I think it's, I would right. watch the hell out of it. Yes, you would. It I'd would be it. three yeah, and a I half would. hours long. Yeah. Oh, my and God. And then, it, you know, it would. You know. The um, Rotten Tomato score would be wild. Here's somebody. This is. Okay. I wonder if this is interesting. What about Ryan Johnson's Buckaroo Banzai? <laughs> Ryan Johnson, I feel like could do like this. Knives Out, a hunt, brick. like no joke. I, yeah, I, I still don't want anyone to do it. I but. feel like right. <laughs> you guys are leaning too hard into Buckaroo Banzai being a comedy. It is not. No, no, I didn't say it was a comedy. I didn't say it was a comedy. But, you're, but, you're, but the, I think I there is a but light it's, it touch is a wack, to it. It is wacky. Whereas it is like, a wacky movie. I, yeah, I think there's a wackiness and a light touch to it that Denny Villeneuve has Does yet to have. show. <laughs> uh, I think that um, he has facets. And yeah, that's, yeah. We're looking for something okay. different. Yeah, like, yeah, okay. We wouldn't want to see right. a remake. This would not be a remake. Okay, you're right. You're right. No, you're, you're right. right. That's not I am right. <laughs> Lisa's got the most intense I am right I face. I am right. I, I expected you both to be 100% on board. And I okay. love the guy. I I'll just, I need, I need, I need some, some sweetness and some humor. And no. I just uh, had another idea. Yeah. Okay. I just had oh, here we go. Okay, Brad. Go what for about, it. Like, he's not with the Fast and Furious franchise anymore. What about Justin Lin? Justin oh, Lin. That oh, would be man. Cool. I'd go with I think Ryan Johnson I I'm on board with Thank Justin Lin close together. second Denis Villeneuve I I love you but I I'm I'm afraid that would sap the joy from Buckaroo Bonds I that uh, I need. but I think that zapping the joy might be just the thing uh-huh. <laughs> and like robbing him of the budget right like you you're like you got to yes, do this yeah. in twenty mil you got ten. <laughs> Hey, okay. If he has twenty million to do this movie, I would love to see what he comes up with. I think that would be an incredible feat. I don't for, think you'll uh, like my next for all involved. Oh no, what's your Uh-oh. next suggestion? Nicholas Winding Refn. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's another high fashion, all aesthetics, super shallow. Oh my has God. he been canceled, or is he still good? I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't know. I he will be him. after he makes a Buckaroo Banzai movie. <laughs> He'll be trash. <laughs> I've I've brought nothing to the table. I really can't. Like I'm I'm Ryan Johnson was like I think for me I'm I'm on board with that. So But my question I'll to second you the Sean, Ryan Johnson one. What do you think your experience with this movie will be going forward? Is this a film that you see yourself revisiting because of the fond memories of this first uh screening? I'm going to call it a screening. I'm going to pretend you went to a theater and saw it for the crowd. <laughs> uh with this past screening, like do you see yourself returning to this movie? Yes, a hundred percent. I would, and it's a, speaking of screenings, I would like rally people to go see this yeah. if this was playing at like the plaza. Like I, if it was showing there, I would be like, no, come on, we're gonna go do this. This is gonna be fun. It's a ridiculous movie. Just trust me. Let's go. Like I feel like it's a movie that needs to be seen more than once. That you will get more and more each time you watch it like you'll get a little dig a little bit deeper you'll find new things you'll pick up on maybe i'll understand the plot maybe (laughs) i'll know what the eighth dimension is but at the same time i don't need to know i don't want to know i can embrace it for being incoherent uh and that's almost the way i feel it should be i was at seen and interpreted i was at work and i mentioned like oh i gotta hurry home gonna watch buckaroo bonsai across the eighth dimension and um one of my coworkers turns to me who has a teenage daughter and goes like oh man i love that that movie i wonder if my teenage daughter would love that movie and i go like only if she discovers it on her own Mm. i don't think that you could Mm. show this to a teenager as a parent and go like hey this is what this is a fun whimsical movie like like you can you cannot watch buckaroo bonsai with any irony in your heart and mind you just have to go in exactly arms wide open creed style (laughs) (laughs) a creed reference (laughs) what is happening 
<laughs> we got a Creed performing the the new hit for Denis Villeneuve's <laughs> long anticipated sequel to Tucker Ufans. What about Sam Raimi? I'm into it. Okay. I would I I would see anything Sam Raimi directs. Yes, I would see that. Yes. Sam Raimi is my new pick. Why do you... I know he just did Doctor Strange, and I know Brad bent over backwards to try not to spoil it for me, but I would still see Buckaroo Banzai directed by Sam Raimi. Mm-hmm. He's got that perfect blend of campy and sincere. Oh, yeah, like his I films so. just strike that balance, and I think but does he have Buckaroo the Banzai has that as well. Not. No, he doesn't. Um, <laughs> but you can like hire, you know, uh, Ruth Carter. <laughs> to, <laughs> <laughs> the first costume designer that I thought of, Ruth Carter, to perfect. bring the fashion. Well, that's that's great. Is there anything else we need to say about Buckaroo Banzai? It's brilliant. It's, it's one blast. of my all-time favorite blast. movies. It's my eighth favorite film. Is it really? True story. Eighth dimension, Ta- eighth favorite film. Give wow. them give them the sandwich. What is the bread for Buckaroo Banzai? What is uh, seven me, and hold, ten? Let me nine, think. Seven I, well, I got to go through the whole ten then. Okay, yeah. Go through so the my whole favorite ten. film of all time is Jaws. Mm-hmm. Uh, followed by An American War of London, followed by John Carpenter's The Thing, followed by Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, followed by Miller's Crossing, followed by Point Blank, followed by 2001 A Space Odyssey, followed by uh, Buckaroo Banzai, followed by Sweet Smell of Success, and then 10 is Alien. I think that's like um, 2001 and Sweet Smell of Success, like being s- <laughs> snuggled around mm-hmm. Buckaroo Banzai just feels right. I agree. It it feel it's that is a that is a sandwich I would happily happily with Come what, on. With, with what? <laughs> what? Put put in my body. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's the watermelon doing there? It's great uh, with feta. I... <laughs> um okay. How many big booty booties yeah. would you give Buckaroo Banzai on booty. a scale from one to five? <laughs> <laughs> Brad, Brad, I think we know Brad's rating. Yeah, it's five big bootes. <laughs> All right, Lisa, how about you? I would give it four big bootes. I'll give it three and a half. All three right. and a half big bootes. So oh, it's this quite is, the relief. This, it's it, no, it was very, very fun, and I enjoyed it, and will be watching it again. So thank you for introducing me, and Brad, Lisa, who would like to take point on telling the wonderful world of missing framers what you two are doing on the internet you can do it brad all right uh you can find us every week on the comic book couples counseling podcast at comicbookcouplescounseling.com or wherever you stream your podcasts uh we've been doing a bunch of interviews lately we talked to the legendary stan sakai creator of usagi yojimbo if you like buckaroo Banzai, i bet you like usagi yojimbo uh, I don't know if you heard, but there's a new sort of adaptation of that comic on Netflix called Samurai Rabbit. And we talked to him about that. And we've also had Jeff Smith, the creator of Bone, the Scholastic Ooh. Masterpiece, talking about his new comic, Tukey Fight for Family. Uh, both of those episodes are like dreams come true for brad and lisa um i really can't believe that they agreed to come on our tiny little podcast and we would love for missing frames listeners to check those out but normally what we do is we pair a self-help book up with a comic book couple uh our next couple is going to be angela and sarah from the marvel comic book series angela asgard's assassin uh we haven't decided what the self-help book is yet but I'm excited to find out what that is. And I'm excited to do those episodes. That sounds wonderful. And you two are wonderful. And we're, 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 we already know you're at Mouth Dork. Mouth Lisa, Dork. where can people find you? Oh, I'm at, at si- Mouth Dork. I said at Mouth, at Mouth Dork. <laughs> I'm at Sidewalk Siren. <laughs> like Sidewalk, like we, you walk on it and Siren, like those noise that's made. Um, I, I came up with it in middle school and I'm just writing that screen name to the end. To the end, I'm going to be an old I lady. Love it with that screen but lisa's no, no, a great, great follow I support am i really you I do are a, yeah i try you're a great follow as you is are, our yeah. podcast on twitter cbcc podcast oh, yeah. at CBCC there you go podcast. Oh, yeah. perfect and i'm at yay sean dorman on twitter i'm sean dorman 05 on letterboxd and brad lisa you're wonderful lisa i'm so glad you're finally an official missing framer thank you for being on and thank you everybody for listening we will see you at the movies Hey man, what's in the big pink box? (laughs) 